Hi, this last video is going to cover the quiz questions that uh, more than 30% um, um, of the class got wrong. So I'm going to just sort of discuss them one by one. Um, so question number one is from the quiz one. And the question was, which of the following is not true about energy stored and released in cells? And there were a bunch of options. Uh, most of uh, most of which sounded true, and you guys correctly did not choose. However, so, uh, a number of people chose that all of these statements is, are true. However, the answer is that ATP can be hydrolyzed to AMP and PPI, but the energy released is not used to form chemical bonds. That is not true, uh, and that was the correct answer. So let's talk about that. Um, so. One, uh, it, it is a little bit, all not questions are hard to deal with, um, uh, hard to answer because it's hard to think about, if you're trying to get something right, it's hard to figure out when you're thinking about your information, what of, which one of the options is actually wrong. So ATP can be hydrolyzed to AMP uh, and pyrophosphate and um, this the energy released can be used to form chemical bonds. One of the it's actually used in uh, a number of situ number of reactions in the cell. It's not it's not as common, obviously, as an ATP to ADP conversion, but uh, a lot of the reactions release pyrophosphate. Uh, one of the most famous reactions probably is that is uh, occurs during the synthesis of DNA or RNA, where um, in case of if we're talking just ATP. When RNA is synthesized, ATP is hydrolyzed and AMP is incorporated into growing RNA chain and pyrophosphate is released. And um, as you can see there, that there is a chemical bond that's formed and it's the phosphodiester bond between the AMP molecule and the preceding um, um, ribonucleotide molecule inside the growing the RNA chain. So hopefully this clears that up. Another question that a lot of you guys did not get was um, the question about transcription factors and uh, which functional tr class the transcription factors belong to. And the options were mortar proteins, reversible binding, enzyme catalysis, and non-specific DNA binding. A lot of people for some reason chose enzyme catalysis. So transcription factors are binding proteins. That's their function. Remember how there's three protein functions, um, receptor ligand binding or reversible binding, um, enzymatic or catalytic function, and motor protein function. And motor protein combines these two pre preceding functions. So transcription factors, I cannot think of any example of a transcription factor that has motor protein capability where it moves along the DNA strand for some reason. Uh, I also cannot think of any transcription factors that catalyze any sort of chemical reactions. I mean, their job is to bind to a certain area of DNA specifically, and then hopefully recruit either other transcription factor, like proteins, or um, just flat out the RNA polymerase to that particular location. And I talked about transcription factors in lecture one when I was talking about different, uh, different protein functions, because I used um, transcription factors as an example of um, specific DNA binding and how Knowing what DNA binding means and understanding what K, uh, KDs mean helps you to understand how DNA replication and RNA transcription works. So you guys can see this is your typical transcription factor. It's binding to the usually forms hydrogen bonds with the nucleotides with the base, bases of the major groove of the DNA which allows the transcription factor to stay in that particular location. Because it's bound in that particular location nowhere else, it, does a, it actually uses specific, uh, it, it binds to DNA specifically in as much as it selects particular base pair combinations to select where it's going to bind. They also tend to bind in clusters um, and then uh, dimerize together to then uh, be able to recruit either RNA polymerase to the location or other proteins. So hopefully that clears up this question. Um, the next question that I think people got wrong because they either hurried up or really did not understand the Chagraff rules or 
afraid of equations. I don't know. It was weird. So the question is, which of the following was observed by Irvin Shargraf? Remember, that was the guy before Watson and Crick who carefully measured um, the amounts of adenines, uh, amounts, amounts of A, T, Gs, and Cs in different tissues and different organisms in the same organism over its life, etc., and realized and came up with the four Shargraf rules. And um, the correct answer here is that the DNA isolated from different tissues, all the same species, all have the same base composition. And that should be obvious because hopefully you guys now know really well um, that every single cell in our body contains the same DNA. They might be making different RNA from that DNA and thus look differently. Our muscle cells look different from our fat cells, but they all contain the same DNA inside of them. Um, however, a lot of pe pe people chose this last answer of in all species A plus T equals G plus C. Now, that is not uh, Shagraf's rule number four. Shagraf's rule number four states in, that in all species there's the same, about the same amount of adenine and there's thymidine and the same amount of cytosine and there's guanine. That rule allowed Watson and Crick to conclude that the C's must be binding to G's and A must be binding to C's and that's the reason for the equal amounts of these bases because these bases base pair to create the DNA. A plus T equals G plus C means that in uh, all organisms we have the same amount of ATs and GCs and that's not true. There's GC rich, there's organisms with, with GC rich genomes and there's organisms with AT rich genomes. And it's actually one of the ways to how genomes were def 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 defined early on. So hopefully this explanation has cleared that up. I hopefully uh, I, I hope that it, this was not that most people who selected it was just were hurrying up too much. So I urge you guys to consider before you select uh, to consider all the possibilities. Just one more time, it helps. Okay, next question that a lot of people got wrong was which of the following is not a feature of the DNA helix proposed by Watson and Crick? Um, the correct answer is two grooves of equal dimensions because even though the helix has two grooves, it has a narrow minor groove and a larger major groove. So the grooves of the DNA helix are not the same despite what you see in you know many illustrations of the DNA out there. A lot of people take a lot of liberties, and just because they drew a, um, a double helix does not mean they actually drew a proper DNA molecule. Uh, however, a lot of people um, selected right-handed instead of the two groups of equal dimension. So um, the DNA helix is indeed right-handed. Now, when, <laughs> when, this, uh, when my computer is recording this lecture, this will seem like my left hand, so I shouldn't be using my hands to explain things. Um, anyway. Um, this illustration right here hopefully clarifies stuff. The helix of DNA is right-handed, and the, um, and this is a left-handed helix that goes the wrong way. And I will give you guys half a point um, on quiz two if back, unless you have gotten a 10, then sorry, I'm not going to give you 10.5. Um, so if you're going to want to get extra half, half a point credit, if you send me an image of a left-handed DNA helix, and there are plenty because illustrators constantly make mistakes when they draw DNA because they're not biologists, I'll give you half a point back. So hopefully this makes up for that. Hard questions. Okay, next question is from the quiz number three, which is the DNA replication quiz. And the question is, each replication fork requires both leading and lagging strand synthesis because, and the answer is because the DNA templates are anti-parallel, and but the DNA polymerase can only synthesize in one direction. And a lot of you guys got it wrong, so I put this up again. <coughs> and I think that I have provided very thorough explanation in the lecture about the leading and lagging strand, and there's massive amounts of YouTube videos on the subject. So, um. um yeah, so so please be careful when you select your answers. I, I'm very puzzled why people would have thought that any of the other answers was an option. Okay. 
So, so the next question was, which of the following is not necessary for DNA polymerase reaction? And a lot of people selected all of these components are necessary. Okay, and actually when I mean a lot, uh, I mean about 30%. Majority of you did still get it right. Um, so a lot of people select that all these components are necessary, but ATP, which is a ribonucleotide, not a deoxyribonucleotide, is not necessary for DNA polymerase chain a polymerase reaction because the energy inside a DNA polymerase reaction comes from the DNTPs, aka DATP, DTTP, DGTP, and DCTP. They also have these three phosphates in a, next to the ribose, and they also carry a lot of chemical energy and unstable bonds that allow for the catalysis of this particular reaction. So, um, which what was not meant to be a trick question, I honestly did not think this was going to be confusing, it turned out to be a trick question, so just, yeah, ponder a little bit more what you're selecting when you're answering quiz questions. So same goes for magnesium. Which of the following correctly describes the roles of magnesium ions in the polymerase reaction? I honestly don't remember right now of hand what were the other choices selected, but the correct one is that magnesium ions here, in this case the first one, is what prepares the 3 OH group by deprotonating, taking away its hydrogen, hydrogen from the OH and uh, allowing, because the magnesium took off the hydrogen, the negatively charged oxygen here is now much more willing to um, um, to participate in the in the formation of a phosphodiester bond reaction here, which will release these two uh, phosphate groups as pyrophosphate. And the second magnesium merely deprotonates, merely interacts with the with the second and third phosphate of a DNTP molecule, holding the Triphos uh, the triphosphate molecule in a particular orientation and placing, allowing for this magnesium to be just so close that it can interact with these two oxygens and per perform the reaction. Now the magnesiums themselves are being also held by the aspartate. Sometimes it's also glu um, uh, glutamate in different types of DNA polymerases that holds the magnesiums in place. Both aspartate and glutamate are negatively charged amino acids because they have a carboxyl group at the very end. So that's the main reason why we actually add magnesium to PCR reactions. They're either already part of the buffer or you can play with magnesium concentrations in order to optimize your polymerization reaction because magnesium is the actual catalyst of the, um, of the polymerization reaction. The aspartates don't actually uh, facilitate the reaction. They merely hold magnesium in place, which acts as a prosthetic group of sorts inside the DNA polymerase. And if DNA polymerase is denied magnesium, it will not function. The function of a ligase. The function of the ligase is to glue together uh, phosphate, um, uh, phosphate ester bonds. So it catalyzes the formation of covalent bonds between adjacent nucleotides. It doesn't actually act as a polymerase because both um, here the, the C is part of a polymeric chain and the CT is part of a polymeric chain. It doesn't, but it does, and the way it catalyzes the, um, the, the, the covalent bond is different, different from how DNA polymerase does it. Instead of a negatively charged group, it has a positively charged charged amino acid here, a lysine, and we did not cover that, um, but as long as you guys remember that the ligase glues stuff together, it ligates, and what, by, what ligation means in this case is that a covalent bond is formed between uh, two adjacent nucleotides inside a long DNA molecule. Um, this is just a description of their reaction, let me go over it briefly. Um, and a lot of people, for some reason, chose catalyze the formation of hydrogen bonds between adjacent nucleotides, and that's really sad that you guys chose it because hydrogen bonds don't hold together adjacent nucleotides. Hydrogen bonds are formed between the bases inside the double helix. They are much, much weaker than uh, the covalent bonds of the, the phosphodiester bonds of the backbone. 
they come apart if you heat DNA to 100 Celsius. The covalent bonds of the back of uh, of um, of the back of DNA backbone will not co come apart until you he heat it to many hundreds of degrees of Celsius. Um, and you would have to po provide a catalyst to boot. So. Um, So the first thing that happens is that ATP, um, ATP comes and uh, loads up an AMP molecule inside the ligase binding active site, and then this um, presence of the AMP molecule, um, see AMP forming a covalent bond, a chemical bond, with the amino group of lysine, creates an environment that will allow for uh, the catalysis uh, of for. Um, attachment of this AMP molecule to the oxygen of the phosphate that is not connected to the 3' IH, so this is a 5' phosphate. And then um, presence of AMP here will um, catalyze the formation of the phosphodiester bond and then the AMP is released and a proper phosphodiester bond between these two nucleotides have, has been created. I don't need you guys to know that in this great detail, I just wanted to show you how the reaction works. Okay, now the trombone model of DNA replication. So here I actually have to say sorry because um, a lot of you guys chose this and that's the correct answer, but then a lot of you guys chose this question. As a Kozaki fragment are extended by pole 3, the loop of the DNA template, template grows and that is correct. And so I went back and gave everybody who also chose this answer extra points back. I mean one point back to their quiz, so your grade for quiz 3 has increased. If you guys want to watch more DNA replication, um, there's this is one of the videos. There's so many DNA replication videos on YouTube, you can watch them for days <laughs> and really know DNA replication. But let's go through the answers. So the first uh, choice, when a new beta clamp PCNA is loaded, primase is triggered to synthesize as primer. That's not correct. The primase is loaded first, then so here's your primase, it's loaded first, it makes a new primer, and then the PCNA clamp will bind around there and allow the pole delta to extend the primer, forming an Okazaki fragment. This is correct. Binding of the polymerase core to a new primer template complex triggers loading of the beta clamp slash PCNA. That is not correct. It is the PCNA slash beta clamp. So beta clamp is for prokaryotes, PCNA is for eukaryotes, PCNA clamp is loaded first and it brings the DNA polymerase there because you guys can see why the clamp is important. It literally makes a circle around the DNA making sure that that uh, the polymerase can stay there and synthesize this DNA processively as opposed to fall on and off because DNA polymerase does not have a complete hold so there's still a potential of it um, letting go of the DNA and stopping a polymerization reaction. The PCNA clamp holds it right there. So yep, that's correct, and I give whoever chose this answer, you got the point back. Um, and then the last action, uh, last question is, a loop is formed on one strand of the template DNA to allow 5' to 3' synthesis of the leading strand. And of course that's incorrect, because this loop, the single-stranded DNA loop, that is formed as part of the trombone model is the lagging strand. That's why they have to make this extra loop because it takes longer to synthesize the lagging strand. That's why it's lagging. <clears throat> so part of the strand is still coated by the RPA single strand binding proteins to pre prevent the template of the DNA from developing secondary structure. All right. So, and then the last thing, um, I had a few people emailing me saying that this was a confusingly written question. I ran it by other faculty and they said it was not and that I'm in the right here and that there's this question was clear as day and that people just, I think, I guess overthought the question a little bit too much because a few, bunch of you guys selected telomerase instead of telomeres. If I wanted telomerase, I would have said what protein solves the end replication problem of linear chromosomes. The telomeres themselves are DNA. There's DNA of a particular nuclei, uh, um, particular uh, nucleic, nucleotide um, sequence 
you can see the TT, GGGGG, TT, GGGGG, TT, GGGGG, um, that, that the pretty name telomerase makes a whole lot of these telomeric sequence at the end of our telomere, at the end of our chromosomes, to prevent our chromosomes from uh, degrading during the replication. Because it's not a DNA polymerase, but it's a reverse transcriptase, it can actually synthesize DNA in the 3' to 5' orientation, something that the DNA polymerase cannot do. So, um, as a result, this works fine. So, telomeres is the correct answer. Telomerase is not the correct answer. Um, and I believe this... Oh, okay. And then uh, this concludes everything I wanted to tell you guys about the quizzes. I'm going to start uploading it now. And then these are... This is it for the lectures for this week. Sorry, this one comes up on a Saturday. I figured since I was discussing quiz questions from the previous week, it wasn't so urgent to post it on Friday. Um, by Monday, on Monday, we're going to have the, the quiz on DNA mutations and repair. Those videos, videos have been posted on Wednesday. Hopefully you had plenty of time to look over them. Um, uh, and then uh, coming on Monday, I'm going to start the next week. I would like uh, to talk about chromatin. So we're going to see these guys again. Again, we're going to see the chromosomes and the chromatin and the histones and genome. And then on Friday not evening, as far I'm still waiting for everybody to finish voting on that survey. Um, but on Friday evening, we're going to have our exam for all the material we have covered up until then. I might have only one question about genomes so that you guys can mostly focus on DNA structure, DNA replication, DNA repair, and things like PCR and sequencing. So have a good Saturday.